everybody. So it is time to review uh, episode 13, The Elephant in the Room. And I don't know that I'm excited about it. <laughs> it. It wasn't a nothing episode, but I had a lot of feelings I didn't realize I was going to have about a lot of specific instances. So some of the things that happen aren't nearly as important to me, so I just don't have as much to say. As you can see, the whale is back for this video. He's pretty cute. He'll be going off to my nephew for Christmas. I like him a lot. I've been making some octopi that kind of match him. I think I might make one for his sister because she, you know, she's going to need something cute too. At any rate, uh, so this episode, not as exciting as I'd like it to be, but there were some things I did want to touch on. Uh, important point though, I recently heard, and I cannot confirm because I don't have Hulu Live, that the More to Love bonus clips are available on Hulu. If you do have that and you haven't been checking them out, please do. I was able to see at least one that kind of plays in a little bit with this episode uh, from a previous episode where Robin, Mary, and Cody were um, around the fire pit speaking about whether or not they were going to invite the other kids to Christmas. And it actually adds really important context, so I'm very disappointed that they chose to make that a more to love instead of leaving that in. Uh, shame on you, Puddle Monkey. That should have been in, in my opinion. So let's get started. Um, we're going to start off with McKelty's gender reveal. We know she's having twin boys because, well, she had them like a year ago. Um, they're like a year old and you can see them all over Instagram. I don't know what to say there. It uh, looks like most of the family is on the Zoom call, but the thing to note is who isn't on the Zoom call. And it isn't to talk about random family members who may or may not have been invited or may or may not have made it. Robin's children are not on this Zoom call. After being guilted into saying, well, Ari doesn't even know who you guys are anymore, Robin left her kids off the Zoom call entirely. And I... Um, I say that to point out that this is where that context of that more to love clip kind of comes in. So in the more to love clip, Robin is telling Mary that she doesn't really want her kids to be around uh, the other children because the other children fight too much and she doesn't want any of her children seeing that, whether it's the older kids or the younger kids, which essentially convinces Mary to not invite them to her house for Christmas Eve. And then she talks about how she doesn't want her kids around any conflict, but then also says that conflict can be healing so you don't want your kids around because you don't want them to heal. Like, I'm genuinely trying to understand the context of that, and I'm not sure. I really, truly am not sure what she means. Um, but this is her Zoom call she's been dreaming of, and she left her kids off of it. So I'm not sure what the point of that was. So, um... Janelle and Christine kind of mentioned just how deeply divided the family is. We already know the family is deeply, deeply divided, and they'd like to, this call to go well. And the brown kids are kind of piling in, and it looks like pretty much everybody is just purposely focused on McKelty, um, which makes sense. I mean, it is her event, but also there's not a lot of chitter chatter in the background. Um, and it does seem that no one acknowledges each other. And I don't mean that in like a no one acknowledges. Like, you hear Hunter talking to McKelty, and you kind of see people waving and whatever, but the second that Cody and Robin get on the call, it's like, nobody says anything. Nobody acknowledges that they're there, they don't acknowledge that anyone else is there, and maybe it's an edit, that's very well possible, but it does seem weird, and if it's not an edit, just kind of awkward. Um, and honestly, Cody only seems to interact with Avalon at all. It, it, he seems to interact primarily with Avalon. Obviously, he says a few things to McKelty, but he primarily interacts only with Avalon. So, um, Cody does make this all about himself by telling us how anxious he is about being on this Zoom call with the entire family. And then he's like, oh, it's just great because McKelty still wants to be around us. And he keeps telling us that. And then Robin says, I hope seeing Cody and I smiles will let them know I'm not the bad guy. I wish I could explain this in a clearer fashion. In my opinion, and my opinion only, the fact that she is sitting there smiling, sitting next to Cody smiling, probably exacerbates the negative feelings the kids have for her because it's almost to them. Now you have to look at it from the perspective of the children and the perspective of Robin. The perspective of the children is, 
How dare you sit there next to my dad and smile away like an idiot when we're not even allowed to talk to him because of you? And with Robin, she's saying, I'm open, I'm here, you can talk to me. But because they already don't trust her, that smile that she thinks is portraying an open atmosphere is actually causing the other people in the family to see her in a more negative light. And that is why clear and open communication is important. I, I don't know what else to tell you. You made your bed. You're going to have to lie in it. I'm sorry. So then Aurora comes on to tell us how much she really wants to stand up for her mom here. <sighs> Aurora. Girl. <laughs> the whole world sees something different on television than what you're telling us. And whether your real life is your real life or TV is more your real life, but you want to stand up for your mama, don't bring yourself down to elevate others. And by that, I mean the whole world sees something in a very consistent light via television. And by continually defending that the things that we are being shown are not happening, you're bringing yourself down to elevate another person. Elevate yourself, please and thank you. Um, but she also is like, I want to I wanna say my mom's a huge cheerleader. And I have a list of things for Aurora to ask her how this is cheerleading. Number one, um, telling you no one wanted to see you for Thanksgiving. Uh, or how about purposely keeping you separate from your siblings like we saw in that More to Love clip where they said she said you couldn't be around them because they might argue. Um, no. What about exacerbating your anxiety and then putting it on television for the whole world to see? Okay. Um, infantilizing every single one of you and ensuring that your ability to exist outside of her home is diminished because people look at you in a particular light. Even if that is not the home life you deal with, that is the world's perception of you. Stand up, be a strong woman, and show us what you've got, girl. I... I cheerlead for those kids that they will be able to show us what they're made of. Honest to goodness, I do. I, I'm cheerleading for them. Um, so then we cut back to the baby shower where McKelty says, we're not cool enough to have one baby, which twin mom, right? Hits my ear is really odd. I did mine the same way that she did hers, a singleton and then twins. Um, mine are actually... I'm going to say this, and if you're smart, you'll put it together. The exact opposite of her children. Because I'm not going to put my kids' lives onto here. Um, and it sort of implies that somehow having my singleton was cool, but having twins wasn't. And let me tell you, having twins has made me infinitely cooler than I ever was. And maybe that's a little bit selfish. But, like, people look at you and go, dang, you got two humans that you're trying to keep alive at the same time. Yeah. People think I'm cool. And I'm like, people think they're cool. And I'm really cool with that. So <laughs> Janelle's like, I'm glad to see Cody and Robin on the call. They should be here. They're a couple. They should be here with their family. And she's right. But it does feel kind of like a producer driven answer. Like, hey, tell us how you felt about Cody and Robin being on the call. Because frankly, I don't know why Janelle would even talk about it. She wouldn't even mention it. Um, I really kind of doubt that anybody cares that Cody and Robin are there. They're anticipated to be there. It's McKelty and they are family. So McKelty's giving this like super, frankly to me, off-putting answer about how she really wants her family to reunify and I don't believe her. I honestly think she really enjoys the position she's being put in as the bridge between the families and I could be entirely wrong. I've never met McKelty. It is just my opinion, but I feel like she enjoys being that bridge, that stopgap between the entire family and I think she knows that if it, the family reunified, she would lose that position. And I think she both wants her family together, but is also terrified to not be needed. And frankly, I know how that feels because it feels really scary to not feel needed. But it also feels really, really good when you let go of that desire. Um, so Cody goes on to tell us that he was in a state of paranoia with anxiety over this Zoom call. And then he uses the word contempt for the millionth time, the contempt that was thrown at me. And I went and found the dictionary definition of contempt for you. So we're going to define it here. And it is defined as the feeling that a person or thing is beneath consideration, worthless, or deserving scorn. To me, 
That is more what I get from Cody to the other children, to the disobedient children, if you will. I don't get them giving him worthlessness and scorn and um, feeling like he is beneath them. I actually feel like they just want to connect, which is not contempt at all. Um, but then he goes on, uh, Janelle goes on to tell us, I'm sorry, that Cody doesn't really have any connection with the people in these boxes. And nope, you're right, he doesn't. Because they're adults. Bye-bye. No? No, that's not why at all. It's simply because he has chosen a side. And that's, that's the truth. Um, so he says, here's the thing. Tony and McKelty love me and Robin. And we know that. So that made it all okay. I noticed very clearly he did not say that he loved them, that he loved anyone else, that anyone else mattered. It was strictly about him and Robin. Um, and so when they're talking about getting together in person, Janelle's like, I'd love to be able to do that. Christy's like, nah, fam, I'm good. I'm good. Um, and I, she wants to be better about it, but like, girl, no one's asking you to like, no, it's okay. So he, here's a weird tangent. And I put this in my notes because I really, really, really was like, oh my gosh, you got to share with them what you were thinking here. I don't think it's Cody she's avoiding. I don't. I think Christine is avoiding Robin. And I think that Christine should feel okay with that. I know that she and Robin have always had a very strange relationship. She tried really hard to be welcoming and loving and caring. But I think that it really, really hurt her soul the way that Robin treated her. And I think that she wants to avoid that. And that as much as she's mad at Cody, she is much, much, much more put off by Robin. And I have theories. I could be entirely wrong. It could just be Cody. She could decide that she was just done with him and that was it. It is all just my opinion. I'm alleging all of this. This is not fact. Don't worry about that. But in my previous video about Robin and Mary, I had put forth some theories about how they had never been friends. Um, and I feel like there are some parallels to the relationship with Christine and Robin that you could point out. Not why they were never friends, because I don't think that they really were, and I don't think that anybody would argue that they ever were. I don't even think Christine would argue they were. But I think there are parallels that hint to why it might be that Christine is more avoiding Robin than she is avoiding Cody. Um, but I'll try to link that video down in the description just in case you missed it, want to check out why I think that Mary and Robin were never friends. It's not a super long video, but it'll be there if you decide you want to see it. So um, then we get the context for Robin and I are going to be like this and you're not going to separate us. And it is worse than I thought. <laughs> it is way worse than I thought, for sure. Um, so I am all for spouses being a team. I am 100% rah, rah, you should be in a team, you should be together, you should be on the same page. You know, that's that's how marriages work. That's how families work when the parents are, you know, on the same page with the same general things, similar values, similar ideas on child rearing. Those are fantastic things. And those are all things that are important. What is bad <laughs> is when you elevate one parent and denigrate your children. Um, and by that, what I mean is, um, so obviously, I, I have husband. Um, and we have three kids and I would never, ever, ever risk my relationship with my children just so that I could elevate my spouse. And by that, I guess we all know someone I'm sure who has had a bad relationship with a parent, with a sibling, with somebody in their life that they have decided to move away from. And so when you are connected to the person they've decided to move away from, say you're married, whatever, you can put out that boundary of you're going to respect that person and we're not going to talk badly about them when we are together. But when we are together, my attention is on you and my attention is on our relationship and you can keep that separate. I, I, I know plenty of um, instances where there has been maybe a, a sibling disagreement and one sibling has said, I no longer want to be involved with this sibling. We are adults now. I am not required to. Things are too bad. They are too hurt. But they don't involve their parent and make their parent pick sides. Because that's not the point. You still are respectful when you speak to your parent. But they don't elevate that sibling over you and 
pick sides of relationships, if that makes any sense. I hope I'm making sense. Um, but the answer is Cody has chosen a side and the side he has chosen is Robin. And he tells us that you're not going to separate us. They don't want Robin. So they're not getting me. And that doesn't make any sense. That's not how relationships work. That's not how interpersonal relationships work at all. Um, so it's not all or nothing, Codester. That is not how this should work. So then I have two computer mouses, mice, whatever, sitting here on this seat. One is for one thing and one is for another, and I keep touching the wrong one. So then, um, we had to call out Mary's absence on the Zoom call for some reason. And honestly, it was probably just a segue to Parowan. And I understand that off the show, there have been some allegations, there have been things. I don't have enough information to feel comfortable talking about those on this platform. Um, I just don't. And so I'm not going to bring that into here. All I will say is that for people who don't know what is going on off the show, it is an awkward transition. It does not make sense. And people would be like, I don't, okay, uh, that was weird. So we'll leave it there. Um, so we get to Mary, she takes us to the carriage house. It's a construction site. Everything is kind of being torn apart. She recaps her anniversary and it's obvious that tearing apart the carriage house is sort of a metaphor for the things in her life that are being torn down and rebuilt into something better, which gives me great hope for her. Great hope for her that maybe by this point she has seen some of the things that Cody said about her in season 17 and is realizing, mm, I don't want to do that. Thank you, though. No, thank you. Um, and she seems pretty ready to let things go. So then we're off to Isabel's going away dinner, also known as the world's most uncomfortable talk with Tony. And I'm not going to get into details here because it is super uncomfortable. But what I will say is it seems like Tony either... Uh, Tony's either spying for Robin or he wants to make Christine his second wife, in my opinion, because these are not conversations people generally have with their mother-in-law at a family dinner where her minor children are present. I'm just saying. Um, it, it, it's too much. It's it's too much. And so McKelty's like, you need to get reacquainted with your body. And I'm like, can we not? Truly is right there. Like, can we not? And you can see Christine flushes. She gets kind of red as they're talking about stuff like that. And he's like, you know, you can't, Tony's like, you got to stay in practice. And she's like, I haven't, I, um, uh, okay. And she, you can tell she just wants to shut this down. And she is trying to find a way to like, keep truly from figuring out what they're really saying. And she's like, I haven't been dating. And he's like, yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, why? Why are you being this way? Stop. But... Mitch comes in clutch to save the day, as he has been, and tells her that she should get an account on for Farmers Only. And I am telling you, I said this in a short, I'm going to say it again. I don't want to see that. What I want to see is Mitch take Janelle, put her on for Farmers Only, right? Right? Follow me. And then he will manage her social media aspect because she said she doesn't want an online date because she doesn't get the swipey swipey, Right? Which, you know, that's really mostly just Tinder. So as long as you're not on there, you don't have to worry about it. But she says she doesn't understand the swipey swipey. So then Mitch goes and he t does all of that. And we can call it, don't you steal this TLC. We can call it Farmer Matchmaker Mitch. Finding love with Farmer Matchmaker Mitch. Tell me you wouldn't watch it. I would watch it every week. And it is just Mitch setting Janelle up with great farmers. But the criteria is stuff like must have large greenhouses and even larger fences. So I'm telling you, we need that show. Then we get a trip to Idaho with Christine and Janelle to go see Christine's brothers, Steve and Levi. And Steve is her full brother. Levi is her half brother. They explain it in such a way that it's just easy to say it that way, guys. You don't have to explain. Every He's your half brother. And... I'm telling you now, Christine obviously looks like Annie, right? Like, we've known she looks like Grandma Annie for forever. Levi must look like Papa Allred, which is what I'm calling her dad because I don't know his name. He, was, he must look like Papa Allred. And then Levi and Peyton could be brothers. They're so similar looking. So Peyton obviously got Papa Allred's jeans is all, all I'm saying. Um, but 
Janelle and Christine are chatting in the car on the way up there and Christine's like, hey, Robin mentioned that I would have to do all these things to be divorced. I thought everybody had left the church. Janelle's like, I haven't gone to church with anybody in a long time. And so um, Christine's like, well, I think Robin feels like I invalidated her marriage. Do you feel like I invalidated yours? And Janelle's like, no, I don't even think I'm married anymore, which <laughs> thank you. So um, she admits Cody's not been to her house in 10 months. And a lot of people were like, no, that's not true. He was there to look at the apartment. And that's not what she means. He, she means that he has not been there in a full functioning marriage with her in all of that time. He's not stayed the night. He's not anything because she told him, go. So if he hasn't been around, he hasn't been around. And we know he's not trying to reconcile things with her. In fact, he's ready to give up anyway. So, um... If we are taking the timeline of they broke up in December of 2021, right? This would mean that somewhere in the realm of September to October 2022 is where we're sitting. So we are rapidly catching up. Rapidly. Now, I could be off on that by a little bit, but somewhere in that general realm. Um, they discussed when Robin came in and all the traditions just kind of flew out the window how they didn't do Friday night dinners. They didn't do like very specific things like three day long Thanksgiving, and which makes me think that each wife got a turn to make Thanksgiving dinner, which is kind of cute. Um, and so I'm making kind of a list of the traditions that were lost when Robin came in. And number one on the chopping block was uh, the birthday parties for Joseph Smith, which let me tell you, I am fine with getting rid of Joseph Smith's birthday. I think it's kind of weird personally, but hey, it was a tradition. Y'all do you. Um, so they get up to Idaho and they go zipping around on some ATVs for a little bit, just kind of riding around, having a good time, kind of unwinding. They go back to the house and Steve sort of just completely debunks polygamy for Christine. He's like, yeah, no, it was awful. Everybody screamed at each other all the time. It was, it was terrible. And Christine's still like, no, it's great. I wanted to live this because my mom was so happy. Christine, baby girl, your mom left your dad when you were 19 because she was unhappy. <laughs> Oh, honey. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's okay. If you have your memories, you have your memories. If they're happy memories, I am happy for you. But Steve is like, nah, this was not good. So Janelle's like, well, you know, it'd be better if, if everyone had legal status. And I understand what she's saying. But the law is the law. The law has not been changed. And when you live outside of the law, you live outside of the protection of the law. So unfortunately, choices that you make... <laughs> have afforded you no protection. We can all discuss till the cows come home whether or not that law should be changed, and in my personal opinion, it should not. I, I don't think that that should be a thing, but we can all discuss that till the cows come home. The reality is that as it is written, you live outside the protection of the law, the law cannot protect you from what you've done. Um, so in between all of that, though, as they're talking about it, all of those kinds of things, we get... Cody, in typical Cody fashion, having no clear plan, he tells us he sold some cars to Brian, and Brian comes up with a trailer to get them, and he, they didn't measure the trailer, or the car, or something, and there's no space. And of course, it is just a conversation rife with innuendo, and you're like, oh god, can we stop talking about this, please, please. And he's talking about square pegs and round holes and trying to force things, and you're like, bro... I know you want me to feel some, like you're a sympathetic sympathetic character, but actually this just makes me angrier at you. I'm sorry. Like I, you're trying to tell me now that something that you claimed worked for forever doesn't work because the people were wrong. Sorry, not falling for it. So he says he sold um, a truck and the white sports car and something else, I think. And if that's his brother's truck he sold, I swear, Cody, that's awful. I didn't see which one it was, but if that's what it is, that's awful, bro. Come on. Um, but then we have to hear all about the white sports car and how fundamental it was to their entire lives, how Robin fell in love in that car, and how Janelle thought Cody loved it because it had a back seat. And let me tell you, it does not have a back seat. It has a shelf in the back for placing things upon. Let me tell you, there is no way that Maddie would argue that that thing has a backseat after that five-hour journey to Robin's house to ro watch Robin's kids. <laughs> Maddie is not going to tell you, oh, yeah, that thing's got a backseat. Mm -mm. Um, so this whole segment, like this whole section with Cody, I honestly feel was supposed to make it seem more sympathetic about, you know, how Cody's coming to these realizations and we should feel badly for him that things are falling apart. And I just don't. I don't. 
none of it made me feel bad. Most of it just made me think, oh, hey, look, we're back to the parts where the Browns don't plan anything, because we've seen that a lot. Um, and that's it. It's really everything we've got. Next week, Mary's going to break up with Robin, and more power to her. Uh, I'm going to bet that that is probably the season finale. So everybody start mentally preparing ourselves now, because they don't tell us when it's coming. So start mentally preparing yourself. I personally am probably going to go to the local Aldi grocery store and get a bottle of uh, the $5 bottle of the sweet cranberry wine. If you have an Aldi near you, this is not a sponsor. It is just my favorite. Try it. Five bucks. You can't go wrong. Um, so I'm going to toast to Mary finally getting out. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And then we reached our subscriber goal. So my husband is going to sit down and watch the first episode of Sister Wives. And then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to sort of interview him about it. Kind of ask him some different questions about like, okay, so what'd you notice? What'd you think? What'd you see? I'll, I'll you know, give a brief recap, recap of the first episode, which as we know, there's not much to recap there. But I'll kind of give you a rundown of the different things. I'll ask him some different questions. If you have specific questions you'd like him to answer pertaining mostly to Sister Wives, um, he probably will not answer a ton of personal questions, but pertaining mostly to Sister Wives, uh, if you leave them down in the comments, I will do my best to compile a list. We'll go through it. We'll find the questions that are most frequently asked or the best questions, and we'll do those for that episode. And then if there's a really good list, I'll kind of just sneak up on him and make shorts of him answering the other ones anyway. We'll see. Uh, but I'm really excited for it. He's really excited for it. So thank you so much for a thousand subscribers. We're really excited to do this video for you guys. And really, until we get something cool, I'll see you then.